As Monica said, my name is uh, James Painter, and my real area of expertise is we've done a lot of studies on how the media around the world uh, cover climate change. Uh, we've done studies on AR4 and AR5. Uh, we've also looked at risk and uncertainty, which I know a lot of people are interested in. And, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to put, talk about something else. I'm actually here under slightly false pretenses because Christian was going to give this talk, but he can't chair and talk at the same time. And the reason is that I was part of a project called uh, the JPI Project, Joint Programming Initiative, uh, on AR5 uh, in Europe, which was coordinated out of Cicero and funded by the Norwegian Research uh, Council. There were various elements to that uh, research. One of them was trying to map how uh, science gets into policy making and formulation. The second uh, sort of strand to the uh, research was uh, examining the role of focal points in several countries. The third strand, which I was also heavily involved in, was looking at media coverage of AR5. But I'm going to talk very briefly now about a different, the final part of that, which was about communicating the uh, AR5 to different target groups. And one thing that really struck me, and perhaps it's the biggest uh, takeaway point, is that I'm not a communication specialist at all. My, my area is media. But if you do speak to communication uh, theorists and specialists, what they do start off by saying is you do have to road test and speak to your users and your key target users before you do any of your communication. And one of the things that really struck me when we did the uh, survey of users was, as far as I could tell, but do correct me, there was very little uh, academic work or sort of uh, 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 non-academic work on how the IPCC were, were, were actually used by policymakers. The evidence tends to be anecdotal, and, and there's a, an awful lot of very strong anecdotal evidence that's always already been mentioned uh, today that they are used very strongly by UNFCCC negotiators. But there are huge gaps in our understanding of what their needs are, even within these variegated uh, groups of policymakers, and what they would find useful in terms of uh, communication. So what we've done is a very small step on that path. And we chose four or five different user groups uh, taken from the 2012 IPCC communication uh, 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 strategy and the target groups they used. So who were those uh, target groups? We looked at policymakers, and of course, there's this huge discussion about what policymakers uh, uh, you, you, you target. But we chose three. We looked at uh, local politicians and councillors in East Anglia in the UK. We looked at the work of CDKN, which has been mentioned a lot already, and we interviewed somebody from the Foreign Office in the UK whose job it was to write briefings for ministers. We also uh, interviewed representatives of the business sector, which I'll uh, come to, NGOs, uh, higher education, and the wider public, uh, which uh, we interpreted as uh, the media. And we had a total of about 30 uh, interviews, mostly, I'm afraid, in the UK, and that's a very strong limitation of this uh, uh, study. But I still think it raises some really important issues that I'd be very surprised if they weren't replicated uh, in other countries. How were they selected, uh, these people we interviewed? And again, I'm sure my academic colleagues would criticize it, but it was actually people who were already used the IPCC reports, who were interested in the IPCC reports, who had strong views on the IPCC reports. And so you could argue that it would probably have been much better to interview people who didn't use the IPCC reports, because you would have got much probably more insights. But that's what we did. And we asked them three very uh, simple uh, questions. How did they use the reports? What did they think about the language and clarity of the reports, and what uh, recommendations would they make? And as Monica said, the full report, uh, which is 98 pages, is on the IPC documentation, but modeled on the headline statements of WG1, there's a very convenient uh, summary as well of about two pages at the start of that 
uh, uh, report. So I, I thought what would be helpful was just to pick out four of our findings. There were 10, uh, as partly because to feed into the already the conversations that have been had and the discussions, but also not to re repeat what uh, Susan is going to say in the next section. So what were these four uh, elements that I would choose? The first is, I think, from all, without exception, all the interviewees found the headline statements from WG1 incredibly helpful. You know, it was quite surprising just how much they mentioned that uh, from a wide uh, variety of uh, sectors and, um, and, and policy makers. And of course, many of them were asking, uh, why wasn't that done for WG2 and WG3 as well? And the media also found that useful. And there's some evidence from academic research from Nature Climate Change Special Edition, if you don't, haven't read it, that actually textually the headline statements made itself, made their way into some of the print media coverage. So I think, you know, a big plus uh, 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 for headline statements. The second was uh, we asked a lot about the derivative uh, products uh, with the business community and without fail, it wasn't a big sample, we looked at uh, somebody from the retail sector, somebody from pharmaceuticals and two people from the finance investment and a couple of others uh, and without exception they found those derivative products, well they knew about them and most of the time uh, they found them very useful but there were some buts, and I don't want to steal the thunder of um, uh, Elliot, I think it is, from the Cambridge University Institute of Sustainability <laughs> Leadership, but they knew about those reports, but there were some issues around you know, how do you write reports for different sectors when the business sector is so varied? Uh, how do you use risk language that they understand, not the risk language that... Um, uh, uh, the IPCC uses, uh, but on the whole, a big plus uh, for those derivative products. Likewise, the other big example was CDKN, and the feedback uh, on the whole was uh, very positive. The third element was specialist writers, and it's a hot topic. I think there was a lot of uh, discussion, or at least people were raising the issue, what do you mean by specialist writers? Do you mean journalists who've got experience? Do you mean science, scientists who are good at writing about science? Do you mean people like Susan who've got vast experience of communicating science? There were a number of people who raised uh, some of the uh, questions which we all know about uh, the problem of working, uh, uh, you know, who has control over the final product and could it ever get through the IPC system? But in general, in general, from those 30 uh, interviewees, I would say at least 80 to 90 percent thought specialist writers were a very good idea on a number of conditions. One, they're brought in early, I think Leo made this point, uh, to build up trust. Uh, so they build, bring them in right from the start and don't just bring in specialist writers, but bring, bring in the graphic people as well, as early as possible. Uh, and secondly, you can put in uh, you know, big enough uh, guarantees that they don't have the final say over the final product. You know, it is an iterative process, which I know Susan will talk about, but the overwhelming feeling was that if you get the right specialist writers and you bring them in early, you can make that work. And the final point, I should stress, I'm only picking out four, there are ten, is the role of uh, new media. I know we've already flirted around this issue, but I would stress that we do actually know quite a lot about this revolution in the way particularly young people, but even older people, now consume information about news and even environmental news. I don't want to plug the Reuters Institute too much, but if you are interested in this area, we, we produce every year the, the Reuters digital news reports, which maps those changes. And they are huge and they are vast, and the speed of them is really quite remarkable of how quickly under 35s are moving to social media uh, or moving away from what we call uh, legacy media. And if you're interested in that area, and we're just about, well, in June we're publishing uh, the latest one in 26 countries, so it's not uh, Anglosphere centric or industrialized uh, world centric. There are uh, reports from urban Brazil and other developing countries as well, where social media are really overtaking traditional media forms as a uh, source of information 
and news. And one of the key aspects, which I know several people have already talked about, is the rise of video. So in terms of young people's consumption of media, but everybody's consumption of, media on social, of a video on social media, 50%, as I'm sure you know, of mobile data traffic in 2015 was video. And that's going to rise by 2020 to 70%, although some people dispute just the, the speed of... So any discussion about using the media has to be rooted in an understanding of how this revolution is uh, taking place. And I would strongly recommend that, you know, the big question is what does the IPCC do uh, and what do the authors do uh, compared to, you know, do you build in in-house speciality or do you bring in people who really understand it? My view is the IPCC authors already have, you know, far too much to do anyway. Getting them to tweet and use social media is probably yet more of a, uh, an onus. But there are people out there in the media and in the youth world who really understand this stuff. And you've got to understand it. You know, every single uh, editor, we have sessions with top editors right across the New York Times to Brazilian editors, and they all say that is where they are putting their money and trying to understand the use of social media and the relationship between legacy media and social media. And if the IPCC are serious about, you know, taking advantage of uh, the new media landscape, you really do have to understand it. And it isn't just a first world issue. You know, we have in, uh, journalists from India coming and explaining the huge boom in WhatsApp and other uh, social media. So my two big thoughts to end up with, road testing, we just don't know enough. This is just a small sample. We don't know enough about how different policymakers use this material and what they want. And the second big issue is, I think, just get really up to date and bring in people who really understand uh, the, the changes in social media and mainstream media. Okay, thank you. So now I have the pleasure to introduce Laura Gallardo. Uh, I am a big fan of Laura. <laughs> she is a Latin American scientist. She's based in Chile. She was born in Bolivia. No, I'm not. <laughs> you, <laughs> that's politically incorrect. Well, <laughs> but you always say you have Bolivia in your heart, so I had assumed you had been born there. No, um, no. And Laura runs something that is very empowering in our region, <laughs> is a center. It's the Center for Climate Resilience Research. And the first time I'd met her, she was one of these very few scientists that can talk about science and get very, very excited about cities and humans and the real world. So she, she has been doing amazing work in our region and I am very excited to have her here. So she's going to react to well, James. Thank you very much, Monica. Presentation. Uh, we are happy to have hired you as our media uh, person. No, <laughs> I'd be happy to. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Um, when I was reading the paper, um, my first comments were regarding the what do we mean by policymakers, which has already come up. The second was about the readability, readability of, of, of the summaries, and that has to do not only with the people writing that, but with the discussions that go through in the IPCC um, co-production or, or validation via governments. Uh, typically, the complications arise in my mind when there is one point of view or another that wants to come in and then we end up with all those phrases that are basically very difficult to understand. Now, regarding the study itself, one, one thing uh, that you Sorry. raised uh, was uh, you said you, you believe that even though the sample is small and is basically UK people, it uh, can be extrapolated to other parts of the world. The issues I, rather than the issues. Yeah. Uh, 
like someone said, I, I would like to see some more evidence for that, uh, <laughs> because it's, uh, it's not obvious for me uh, that, that some of the issues, yes, uh, but not everything, and perhaps we are assuming that in general, and that's not the case. I mean, the, the regional flavors and the local flavors might be very, very different. Um, another point is uh, that this said in the paper is something about the dialogues with uh, policymakers are part of what's going on, but but the dialogue when it happens at the UN level is basically with uh, governments, and the people that are sent to those meetings are people who bring the national perspective. Uh, even though there is an opening for inviting local, say, a local mayor that is driving the thing, even in, in, in Paris we saw thousand mayors coming to the meeting, which is a, an interesting development, uh, the, the IPCC as such brings along the inertia of decisions being made at a top, top down decisions. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, governance is a big issue and, and, and governance, I don't know if it's happening top down or bottom up or in other directions. The governance issue is something to be taking, um, to take a look at because perhaps we are not communicating to the people who are being carrying on, particularly the implementation in, into the next steps, which are probably the focus of what's going to be happening uh, next. Then uh, other small points uh, had to do with the um, small but not small. Uh, for instance, the composition of the of the IPCC communications group. Um, it's small and that's fine, but I wonder about the representation of other cultures, of gender, etc. I don't know, so, but that's something that must be uh, brought into the table for discussion. Um, if we are going to prepare from the beginning at, at starting with a, with people working on graphics, people working in communications. We also have to have in mind the different cultures, the different, different perspectives. And again, who or whom, I don't know, <laughs> we are communicating with. Uh, that's, uh, that's something. And finally, uh, just um, the co-production. I think the co-production has limits. Uh, for instance, in working group one that I'm more familiar with, uh, I cannot see a lot of co-production of knowledge when we are talking uh, climate models. Uh, I mean, it, it requires uh, a lot of uh, technicalities and, and, and disciplines and, and, and particular knowledge that takes decades to provide. On the other hand, to become a journalist, it also takes a lot of time to come into the actual techniques. And I mean, so it's an in-between thing that we can build upon, but not everything can be, can be co-produced. Otherwise, we are going to smear out many of the richness or, or, or a lot of the richness of the IPCC as a body of consensual knowledge and understanding of a number of processes. Uh, and I think that's what were my, my points. So diversity, yep. it's crucial for me in this sense. Great, thank you very much. Um, if you have questions for them, there will be time for that. And for now, we are going to introduce Susan Joy Hassel. She is Director of Climate Communications. Many of you know her. And she's an expert writer uh, for the National Assessment Reports in the US. Um, I also encourage you to watch her TED talk. It's, it's very, very good. <laughs> so we are very lucky to have you here. And uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours. Okay. Is that on? So 
I was asked to tell you a little bit about how we incorporated communication best practices in the U.S. National Climate Assessment. And I think the most important thing to say is that we incorporated communication right from the beginning. And what this means is that a communication perspective and communication professionals were there from the very first meeting. We helped to think about all the questions. How do we organize the report? How do we structure it? What examples do we choose? What scenarios? Everything. So that perspective was there right from the start. Now, of course, we had an incredible team. It starts with the best, latest, most comprehensive science. We also had an editorial team that has experience in explaining complex things in very plain and simple language, and also in how you would present and synthesize large bodies of complex information. And we also used professional quality photographs, and we had professional graphic designers. And as someone said earlier, we actually listened to these graphic designers. They're a great test audience, because if they can understand what, what's being said in these graphics, then other people will understand them too. And now, all of these team members work together in a very integrated and synthesized way. I'm going to stay on this for just a second. Because when I say integrated and iterative, I mean something very important. It's not sequential. So often you have scientists writing reports and then they turn them over to, to writers to edit them. And that's not the way we did this at all. We did it in a very iterative process. So we were working together. Now, I want to say very clearly, the lead authors, the authors always have the final say. But we never actually had those kind of arguments because we talked to them. We said, eh, that word, that jargon, not so good. Let's discuss what's a better way to say it. And we always came to agreement. But the lead authors always have the final say. Um, so one of the things that we did so you understand that it's a continuous iterative process, lots of conversations. Now, among the strategies that were used were simple, clear language and professional quality photographs. So here's some of that simple, clear language. Climate change, once considered an issue for a distant future, has moved firmly into the present. This makes the overarching point that climate change is not just about the future, it's happening now. And when you choose photographs like this, and we selected these photographs based on the science of science communication. There's actually evidence behind this. You might notice something radical. There's a person in this photograph. There are people in the photographs of the National Climate Assessment. That helps to personalize this for folks. So this communicates our, one of our first overarching themes and with a photograph that can speak a thousand words. The second overarching theme Again, very plain and simple language is that impacts are apparent now. They're happening in every region and they're affecting us where we live and work across many sectors. And another great photograph. And then that there's a lot we can do about it, right? We like the idea of synthesizing both of these, the threat and the opportunity together. And I know that's a problem in the IPCC structure, but in this structure, it's not so much. So one of the other things you'll notice, besides that there are people, there are people, they're doing things, they're taking action. And so these are kind of stories about people doing things. And we see here both something in mitigation with reducing emissions, and what these people are doing in Maine is uh, putting in a bigger culvert to deal with the heavier downpours that they're dealing with. So we see actual people doing actual things. Now, in the National Climate Assessment, we put a lot of emphasis on simplified graphics. Here's a graphic. It's not one you would find in a scientific journal, but it's made <coughs> simple enough for a layperson to understand it. And we put a lot of emphasis on this, and we made all of our graphics quite simple. And then we took an even further step. We took a subset of those graphics, and we made them even simpler for broadcast. And we made a set of broadcast quality graphics because reporters don't always have time to create graphics, and especially if you want them to go on the air and talk about your report right after it comes out, you've got to give them something that's ready to go. So while we were in the White House releasing the National Climate Assessment, President Obama, right there, is sitting in the Rose Garden, and he's giving interviews to broadcast meteorologists from around the country. In this case, he's speaking with Al Roker on the Today Show. It's a very popular morning show in the United States. And interspersed in their interview are our broadcast-ready graphics, which we've further simplified and designed specifically to work on the air or in the media. This is a very good thing to do when you're doing a report like this. 
Okay, so I want to say a few things about, don't try and read this, of course, but what I wanted to say is something about how you do synthesis. There is a real art to synthesizing. You don't just go chapter by chapter and put a key message for each one of your chapters. You, take, you step back, you say, what are the big overarching themes? What are the cross-cutting messages that come out of this entire report? And what we did was a number of things. Each chapter had a set of key messages. 30 chapters, five key messages, lots and lots of key messages, too many. So for the report as a whole, what were the big themes? And we came up with 12. Again, working together, integrated as a team, 12 report findings. And we organized our synthesis report, which we called a highlights document, because it was not a summary chapter by chapter, it gave highlights. And we organized it around the 12 report findings. Here you see eight of them and there are four more. And so here's one page out of that report. It was a, about a finding about impacts to infrastructure. And what it drew, it drew on many chapters in the report. And again, you see photographs, you see people taking action. And if you look down in the lower corner, you'll see how we provided traceability. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But at this stage, I want to tell you a little bit more about some of the products and what we printed and what we didn't print and how we used our website. So this synthesis report is the only thing we printed. It's 100 pages plus references. We also printed a shorter executive summary, 12 pages or so. The 800-page report, we did not print it. We put it on a website. It's a great website, state-of-the-art website, highly interactive. You don't just go there and download PDFs, although if you want to, they're there. Rather, you're interacting with the website, and it's very, very much to date, up to date. Um, if you want to learn more about a graphic, you can click on that graphic. You can get the metadata, sometimes all the way down into the original data. You can download that graphic. You can share it on social media. There are little icons for Twitter and Facebook. You can share different parts of the report. So it's very much up to date, really using the technologies of the present. And so now I want to bring you back to this traceability. How did we trace from our synthesis report to the underlying chapters if people wanted to learn more? So I'll zoom in on these icons. Each of these icons represents one of the chapters. There was the urban infrastructure chapter, the transportation chapter, and the energy chapter were all featured in this piece. And so at the front of the overview, the highlights document, you had a table of the icons and the chapters. So if you wanted to go deeper, you knew where to go to find it. So here's, here's something else. In the concluding thoughts, this is a spread, two pages, from our uh, highlights document. And again, you'll see people doing things. These are actually stories, if you will. And if, as a scientist, the word story makes you nervous, try case study. <laughs> <laughs> but here you see people. You know, there they are. They're working on the culvert. There's the efficient bus. We've got people planting a green roof. People want to know what they can do. People want to know that people are doing things, that we're not starting from scratch, that we're already on our way, that we have some sense of what to do about this. And this is the kind of information that helps people get that message and to do it in an accurate way. Now, we placed a great deal of emphasis on communication training for our authors. That seemed very, very important to us. Not just media training, but training in how to give presentations to the general audiences that they often speak to. And so what we did was the week before the release, we had a series of webinars. We did them every single day. So if somebody couldn't make it one day, they could make it another day. And we, 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 present, we put together PowerPoint presentations that they could use, and we gave them lots of advice on how to use them. We also did media training in these webinars. Then we did another media training. It was a two-day training in person in Washington right before we did the release for a subset of our authors who were going to be doing most of that media communication. And we trained them very, very carefully in radio, in television, in print, in how to prepare. And at the heart of all of that communication training were these key messages. We said, look, Everybody wants to know, what, if you had to tell me in one sentence what is this report about and why should I care about it, what would that be? And so we worked that over and over, and as a team, we worked on those high-level messages and we boiled them down and we boiled them down so when somebody stuck the microphone in your face, you could say, this is the most comprehensive analysis ever done of the impacts of climate change on the United States. And you know what it told us? Climate change is happening now. It's affecting Americans, and there's a lot we can do about it. 
So those three messages were the ones that we drilled over and over and over again in our training. Now, of course, we had hundreds of authors, very skilled, very smart people, full of good examples on all this. But when it came down to it, that was the key message, repeated over and over and over. And as we know, the secret of good communication is simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted sources. So here we had the sheet music, and people got to say, say the same clear messages. And with that repetition, this is what the headlines looked like. So I've been doing this for about 30 years, and I think more than any project I've ever worked on, I felt like we got our message across. And you can see it in the headlines. It's happening now, more than a fear. It's already here. It's already changing. We're feeling it. So we got that message across. I wish it said more about the opportunities and about the solution set, but you can't have everything, and you can't do everything in a headline. And so the stories did capture some of that, but at least we, we felt like we got some of that across. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, and I feel like I should mention because it's come up a lot, is the uncertainty language. How did we deal with the uncertainty language? Well, we tried a lot of different things. We tried the lexicon. We had a lot of trouble with it. We felt that it burdened the text so much that people were really struggling to understand what we were saying. We also found that the author teams themselves were having trouble with it, with these two different dimensions of likelihood and confidence, and how to incorporate both of those in a way that worked. We found that we had trouble getting consistency from chapter to chapter in how the author teams were implementing that, that guidance. So we ended up doing something interesting. We didn't want to just get rid of it, but we didn't want it to burden the text too much. So we ended up putting a special section in every chapter called Supporting Evidence. And this, of course, is on the website because the 800-page report wasn't printed. It's on the website. But when you go to any chapter on the website, you'll see something that says Supporting Evidence. And when you click on that, you'll get a number of things. You'll learn about the process that the authors used to come up with their key messages you'll learn about the evidence base for those key messages. You'll learn about remaining uncertainties with regard to that key message. And finally, you'll see an assessment of confidence. And the confidence is in four scales. It's very high, high, medium, and low. And right there where you get that assessment of confidence, you have a chart that tells you what each of those words means. So it's all right there in front of you. Now, one of the reasons we liked it separated was there are some people who really want and need that information. They can go to it, they can get it. There are other people for whom that much information is too much information, and it's confusing. So they didn't need to have it everywhere. And so this way, it's there where you need it, it's not there where you don't need it. And for us, we felt like that was a reasonable solution. I must say that we worked very hard on this. There were lots and lots of discussions over it, but that's where we landed. So, Another little innovation that, that we had was something that we called a network of networks, or the NCA net. And that was 170, it still is, 170 organizations of stakeholders who helped us to take this report and bring it out to their audiences. So there was an education affinity group, and that group works on taking the, the material of the National Climate Assessment and getting it out into the education arena, and lots more. So there was a poll for the report from all of those groups, the NCA Net. Now, I could go on and on, but I think with this, I'm going to stop and be happy to take questions and have a discussion with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. So just one question to Kristen. How much time do we have? Okay, so we have about 15 minutes. So I will just have this to remember. I'm going to start with that side that has been a bit quiet. So uh, Lauda, uh, it's just the two of them, or should we bring Lauda as well, in case somebody has questions for her? Well, all right, first question to the right. <laughs> Please introduce yourself very briefly. Hi, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Adam Corley. I'm the research director at Climate Outreach in the UK. Um, uh, I mean, the, the point that I take from, from Susan's talk, I think, is not that it's, it's possible to do things differently, but that it's possible to do things in an evidence based way. So the reason that we, we advocate as social scientists using things like stories um, or case studies. 
that is, is not because they're, they're wacky or different, it's because they work, they're effective. Um, and I think if we don't take seriously that, that question of how to make the communication of, of IPC to the board as effective as they can be, then we're, we're doing a, a real disservice to the phenomenal work that, that goes into those reports in the first place. Um, I mean, it's increasingly true with, with verbal written communication, but visual communication as well. There's a growing evidence base. Um, and, and, and I think not to use that runs, runs counter to the, to the philosophy of the, of the IPCC. Um, so it feels to me that the question isn't, should we use that evidence base, but what's the best way of using it? How should, you know, social science, I'm using that as a broad term to incorporate all sorts of things, but how should that evidence base be incorporated? Is it, is it part of the evidence that's actually reviewed by the IPCC? Is it as a, uh, an input all the way through the report writing, or is it just at the end as a bolt-on to communication, it, it feels like the, the argument is against that, that, that third option, but it'd be great to hear more about that and from others as well. Um, I suggest you take a few questions and then you, we make the interactive. So I have Oyvind, Nick and Leo. So. Thank you. Um, I am... Um, I recognize that Susan mentioned case studies and I, I think that's uh, very interesting uh, um, to discuss. Uh, we had the, in, in the um, extreme events report, the SREX, it was a special chapter on case studies. And uh, I think it, it's a way to to kind of um, build a bridge between the, the hard science and, and the stories you need to tell, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but um, it's also uh, sometimes challenging, of course, how to pick the right case studies and also how to kind of summarize them in, in an SBM and so on. So it's, <clears throat> so, but um, it would be interesting to hear if, if it's views about, you know, how we best can, can use this kind of instrument in, in, in our report. Nick? A um, couple of observations and one question. So, but I think there is a lesson to be learned here, right, which is basically you had a government whatever government institution you were dealing with directly, who took this seriously and wanted to do it big time. And so I think that that's a lesson right across this room, that, that, that in the run-up to AR6, if governments can be persuaded to actually get the messages out into their own countries using mm. a system like that, that would be great. And I don't think it's ever really happened across all the member states of the IPCC ever. So that would be a lesson learned. I think the other thing the lesson learned is you had a good delivery system I don't just mean the cleverness in which the way the report was done. You mentioned all these stakeholders who basically took it and ran with it. So there was a surround sound noise from so many members of society in the US that nobody could avoid it, right? So I think that's very important too. So get loads of partners behind it. And the final question is how much did it cost? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, have Leo? Thank you, Susan, for this very inspiring uh, presentation. I think it is a fantastic recipe for the IPCC on its main and derivative products that in the first place. My, my question is, has your assessment, has this assessment influenced somehow positions of the, the naysayers, the Republicans, and you know, you know who? <laughs> I think we can, we can cover ah. these four questions if you want. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll do four more. Do you want to start? Yeah, you start. Many of them were to you. Okay. <laughs> so I'll start with, with Adam's point. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, we're, we're, we're a scientific body here, right? And there is a science to science communication and we should use it. There's a tremendous evidence base and everything we did here was based on evidence, was based on science. It, it, it was, so I couldn't agree more. Adam's also done a really interesting piece recently on visual communication, which you can find at their website at Climate Outreach, to talk about the kinds of photographs that you should choose and which ones don't work. And we actually, you know, presaged some of that because his work wasn't out yet when we chose, but mostly I think we chose well. So, uh, Oyvind's point about the, the case studies, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think it's very important. And again, this is evidence-based. One of the things we know is when you're summarizing, things can get very abstract and very general. And when they get too general, they don't touch people. So one of the things you need is concrete stories. 
and we know this again from evidence. So this is why case studies are so important. They do have to be selected very carefully. And as, we, as I was saying in our process, all these things were done iteratively. It wasn't like somebody like me was coming along and saying, let's tell this story. No, I was working together with my scientist colleagues, the experts in every field, and we were choosing the best stories for the best reasons. And so we like to call them stories, they like to call them case studies, same thing, <laughs> tomato, tomato. Um, so I totally agree with that. Um, I agree, of course, with, with all of the points you made, Nick. I don't know how much it costs exactly. Uh, somebody would have to give you that number. But there's no question that this is a resource issue uh, because all of this involvement does, does take some work. I mean, when we first started looking at the photographs and they realized they were going to actually have to pay for photographs, they got a little nervous. But professional photographers do charge for their work. And the price was actually very reasonable compared to what we thought it might be. And, you know, what we used to use and we used in the first assessments were snapshots that our colleagues took when they were out doing field work. And they were okay, but, <laughs> you know, not the same power as something like this. And finally, Leo, you asked a point about the influence of the report and in particular on the naysayers. What can we say about that? I would say that the report seemed to really have influence. It's been out now for a year and nine months. And I felt right after the report, this business of it's moved firmly into the present, that climate change is happening now, that really changed in our country around that time. And you hear it now all the time. And this report has a shelf life. It wasn't just a flash in the pan and over in a few weeks. Even now, we see the National Climate Assessment referenced in the media and referenced in lots of places every day. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the influence has been quite large. As far as influence on the naysayers, I guess what I would say is they're a small percentage. You know, the real hardcore deniers are a very small percentage. And I don't think there's anything we can say that's going to convince them. There's actually very good evidence from our friend Tony Leiserwitz and others that of the percentage of people who say that climate change isn't happening, 93% of those say nothing could convince them that it is happening. Nothing. There's nothing you can say to convince them. And in fact, one of the things we know from the work of John Cook and others is that the more you try to convince them with the facts, the harder they dig in. So it's maybe not the best way, but there are other ways to talk to those people. You go around that locked door, in my view, and you talk to them about the benefits and the opportunities and things like clean energy, which everyone likes, and things like job creation and saving on costs, which everyone wants. And so you know, in our report, we were able to do a little bit of that, but I think that's a larger communication mm -hmm. issue, not necessarily one that IPCC takes on explicitly, but I do think that there are just answers that, to that. Uh, we'll have, James, just for your information, there are people who would like to speak. Okay. Uh -oh. so, uh, I'll um, be very quick in response. Yes, I so do think the, the, the really big issue, and th you know, we haven't got time to discuss it, is how much of the experience of the National Climate Assessment Report in the US can be transferred to the IPCC. It's a very difficult political process. I know you have talked about it, but I think that's where there's some incredibly good lessons, but it's a very different process that you went through that the IPCC. So even though there are fantastic lessons to be learned, which bits of it can be transferred and which not. The second thing, very briefly, on uncertainty. Again, you may be interested in this. We've done a lot of work on how the media uh, uh, repeat or not the various indicators of uncertainty around the science. And I'll just throw out one really interesting aspect. If you compare the presence of the uncertainty narrative, uh, or what we call frame, in the media coverage of AR4 with AR5, the uncertainty frame <laughs> dropped quite considerably, which I think is really interesting, whether that's as a result of the increasing certainty frame or people portraying it as risk, but it is, there is a quite interesting trend in the media coverage that that sort of uncertainty dominant frame that was there in AR4, uh, uh, particularly in the coverage of WG1, did decline quite significantly. Great. Um, I think your name is Heidi. Is that you? Heidi. Heidi? Uh, Heidi, Heidi Colin. Heidi, sorry. Um, great presentation on, on both, both ends and actually kind of a connected question. James, I think in your background reading you had mentioned um, metrics, so defining yeah. clear metrics of what success actually looks like, uh, which I think is a great point. And Susan, I was just going to ask, did you guys have the opportunity to actually define metrics of success up front? I mean, it clearly was a success, <laughs> but did you do that? Not really. Um, we do have people looking at it 
afterwards, and but we did not have clear metrics of success. We know how many hits we're getting on the website. We know how many shares. We know th so we do have some of those kinds of metrics. But but so. just very briefly, one of our main uh, uh, recommendations was I think you know there's an awful lot of experience, and, and Tony and others know this about how you set up metrics the effectiveness of communication with policymakers or with the media. That, so that's out there. You know, there are methods that have been tried and tested, so it's not as if it, you, 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 know, you have to start from nowhere to do it. And I would strongly recommend that you know, we look at those metrics and the processes. So I have you and then Richard afterwards. Hello, it's on? Okay. Uh, my name is <coughs> Silvio Efik but I'm not a surveyor by profession. Uh, I just want to make a comment on the, the presentation that Susan did, very good. And um, I just want to say, though it's peculiar to the development context in the US, and that is what we, where we found ourselves when we were doing the, the advocacy on the AR5 in my country. Yes. Okay. That was that's the same context we challenge we had when we were doing the advocacy on AR5. Um, I, 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 originally, I'm a member of Can International. I'm from the NGO sector, and Can International and uh, Global Action for Climate uh, global, global Call for Climate Action had to spearhead the advocacy in Nigeria, and they took us through this present this kind of a presentation, but. We, the NGOs in Nigeria, what we also found that, that we had to get, uh, we have to get some of um, the science community, the scientific community in Nigeria to simplify the science language, the scientific language into the Nigerian development context before we can, pro I mean, before we can get the, the right language to use for the understanding of the entire people for the press, because each country has its own has its own context. Each country has its own context of how to promote the advocacy. And so what exactly you did are the, 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 the troubles that we went through in the AR5 process. And I'm sure it's gonna be okay. And we, some of us can still borrow that example of making sure that we simplify that language into the development context for it to be easy for us to promote the issues for, to, to, for the common people in the country to understand it. Thank you. Great. Um, I have four people wanting to speak, and then we have to hear from you. And we don't have a lot of time, so I really would appreciate if the questions are very, very brief. Richard. I, I just wanted to ask one, maybe one of the senior IPCC people in the room, why couldn't the IPCC just take this and do it? What, what would be the problem? I suppose that that would have to be answered by somebody sitting there, not the, the speakers. Uh, Lance, you still have a chance to ask? Yes. Um, there was just a point that, that was was brought out that we talked a little bit about in, a, in our breakout session that I wanted to mention. And, and the, the, I remember looking, Jonathan and I both looking on at the National Climate and sort of awe and thinking, boy, that's really one of the, the gold standards of climate communication. It was so well done. Your emphasis, uh, and, and it's not actually a duh point at all, it, it's, a, it's a very critical point. It is, we're, we're talking here about the, the printed word and how, what we do to make that better does need to be more emphasis on bringing out the the verbal word in IPCC communications through some of the things that you were mentioned, presentation training, these really sort of basic, as, as Richard said, comms 101 stuff, but that actually isn't happening as well as it should.
with some of the working groups in AR5 and it didn't with some of the others. And if you think about comms, you know, it's like a dog and the body of the dog is the science and the scientists and the tail is the comms and like in nature, the, the body should wag the tail, but the tail does need to be connected to the dog <laughs> and it wasn't always in AR5 and there does need to be some thought for how communications is is really institutionalized into the into the the um, uh, the communication structure so that it's not just about the printed word it's about the spoken word too um, because we don't need another time with a uh, reporter coming up to us and saying you know could you just get those people in that room to be able to tell me what's going on there in two simple declarative sentences mm -hmm. because they couldn't understand it great so I have Elizabeth and then Tim, and you will be the last one. What's your name? Just to remember. Andreas. Okay. Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth Holland, University of the South Pacific. And thank you very much for the great presentations. I have one question for you that has a multiple elements. What we've heard this morning, both from you and all of the previous speakers, is that for successful communication and successful outreach, we need to have inclu an inclusive approach that produces shared ownership, joint ownership. So from each one of you, what is your one recommendation to do that, aside from including more lead authors from developing countries? Great. Tim? and I think that's very true. But for me, there are two things that uh, are, are, are front of mind. Like, up on one of them about embedding the communications from the beginning. Uh, and I think, Susan, that it, it is, people from the IPCC should sit down with you and work out what is transferable and what's not. But I think that experience is, is, is really key. The second is NCA net. And I'd be interested to know what you felt, you know, if you were gonna rewind the clock, what was it about NCA net that worked really well? and what didn't work so well, and what lessons could the IPCC work from that as well? Because I think, and this came up in our uh, World Cafe discussions, there's a line up to which the IPCC can and should work, but its communications capacities are always going to be limited. So they need to be professional, they need to be effective, but they don't need to do everything. So the NCA net model could well be taken by the IPCC to say what are the criteria on which the IPCC can engage with others. What uh, what is it offering? How does that work? And and I I think that that experience would be uh, would be really interesting t for you to share as well. But I would specifically like to know what worked and what didn't work with it. Great. We have a last question, Andreas. Andreas Fischlin. Last time I forgot I was formerly co-facilitator of the Structured Expert Dialogue, and now I'm vice chair, working group two, Switzerland. What was the ratio, Susan, between the scientists in a more traditional way and the people, I don't know how I want to call them, scientific writers or communication specialists from the very beginning? Uh, perhaps it, uh, the ratio changed through time. That's it. Great. So we'll go in this direction. Yes. Okay, so on the inclusiveness question, Beth, it's, a, it's really important. It's a great question, and I think it also ties to Tim's question. Having the stakeholders involved from the very beginning, the NCA net was set up right at the very beginning, and we actually had an open process where people could submit documents to the National Climate Assessment to be reviewed and possibly used in the report. We didn't promise we were going to use everything that everybody put in, but we did have that open call for information. And we got all kinds of interesting things, including some, you know, very personal, very story-like things, cultures. Um, so I think having the stakeholders involved right from the beginning and having that input coming from them was probably one of the very valuable things. Then they were kept apprised all the way along. They had all these, you know, ongoing phone calls and conversations, so they knew what was going on at different stages. At the end stage, some of them actually did a lot to help with communication, to help with education, to help with outreach in their particular sectors, whether it was agriculture or the water community. And they reached into places that we didn't even know about. So I think that's my answer both to Beth and, and to you about that 
the stakeholders in the NACANET, <laughs> NACANET, NACADAC, the NCA network, <laughs> NCA net. Um, the ratio, <laughs> I don't sleep very much, so it's a very small <laughs> amount of people like me. I was the head of the editorial team, and I had uh, maybe two others that were helping me with, with editing. One was a kind of a science, science writer, one was a journalist, former journalist. And then we had two or three or four graphic designers. We had a web designer. Um, that's pretty much it. And then we had hundreds of scientists. So the ratio was you know, vastly more on the scientists. But we tried to be at all of the initial author meetings. When the authors are sitting there together and thinking through their messages, having someone like me in the room is really helpful. I can have an outside perspective and help them synthesize and think through those key messages, and we can work together in that iterative way. Great. James. Uh, very quickly, uh, my strong recommendation, bearing in mind the huge important importance of the transition to a low carbon economy over the next five years, get the business sector in and think really carefully which sectors within that business sector, and I would strongly re re uh, recommend the finance uh, sector <laughs> into at least, you know, the scoping and the sort of, it was a strong message that the language is used for business is just sort of way off, even in risk terms, from what they're used to. So bring those stakeholders in, as if it's at all possible, very early on in the system. Mm -hmm. the, the one I would say in terms of inclusiveness, uh, the first word that came to my head was education. In, in a very broad sense, but then I think relevance. Relevance for the people outside the so-called developed world. Uh, if you see in this report your reality reflected in some way, mm -hmm. if you see a person that reflects you, then people will get engaged anyway at, at one point or another. So I would say relevance is, is to have the Peruvian reality, the Bolivian reality, the Chilean reality, the Indian, etc., etc., uh, that be very much important. Excellent. Thank you so much for your presentations and for your reaction to James' presentation. I would invite you to give a round of applause to these three great presenters. And I think Jonathan, Jonathan has to come and give you some information about next steps. Yes, so the first next step is out the door and turn left to the uh, cafeteria and that's where lunch is. And if you have an announced allergy, there's a plate with your name on it waiting for you. <laughs> so best, best of luck with that. And um, for the people who hosted the, um, the cafe tables, could you uh, get together and um, produce a little summary uh, for use after lunch. Um, and what I suggest you do is, as, as he, uh, I'm going to find it hard to explain this, but as there were nine tables and th each group of three tables was discussing the same questions, I suggest the three, every three tables that had the same question get together and nominate one host to combine all your um, conclusions for the report so that we only have three rather than nine uh, conclusions. I'm not sure that that made any sense at all. but. Uh, anyway, you get the idea. And then, could the people who are co-chairs or rapporteurs, or as we say, rappers, for the, uh, including on rap rapporteurs on the communication strategy, could they get together here 15 minutes before we um, resume? So we're resuming at 14.15, so if we could get together at uh, 2 o'clock in this room and just run through how that's all going to work in the breakout groups. And the streaming is now shutting down again because we're going to have lunch and you don't want to watch us doing that. And we don't have the technical capacity to join the, the breakout groups which they're going on in four different places. And we'll be back again uh, on the, the webcast on the streaming at 17.15 uh, Oslo time. So thank you very much and bon appétit.